All right, good evening, everyone. For our second to last Armchair Traveler series, I'm Brandon Wilkes. I work for the Haynes Public Library, if you don't already know. Um, again, a, a big thanks to Cindy Buxton and Russ White for putting this whole thing together. It's been a tremendous success, it's been really entertaining. I've enjoyed watching all of these, hearing all these different stories, just like last season. Um, if you have missed any from the previous season, they are all up on the library website uh, and our library uh, YouTube page. Just go to under the uh, go to our website haineslibrary.org under our e-learning tab online programs check them out they're all fantastic uh, it's definitely worth your time and if anyone listening or you know anyone would like to be part of future armchair traveler series please let me or cindy know um, or if you have a skill you want to share a program you want to do we've had Pearl sheldon on recently patty brown on recently doing uh non-library programs and just sharing things they wanted to talk about just give us a call at 766-6420. We can help facilitate that. That's basically my job uh, is to try to make, you know, whatever you want to share, you can share with the community. Uh, I believe we have one more uh, Armchair Trevor presentation left, which Cindy will tell you about. Um, so uh, if, if you're coming in now or, or anyone else coming in, you will be muted upon uh, arrival. Uh, but when we get to the end, please hold any questions you have uh, till the end, unless you want to type them into chat, feel free to type them into chat. Russell can address them at the very end, and you can unmute yourselves at the very end. Um, yeah, I think that's all the all the big points. And with that, I will turn it over to Cindy. Thank you very much, Russell. Thank you very much, Cindy, uh, for helping us continue the Armchair Traveler series. Thanks, Brandon. Appreciate your help. Um, so before I introduce Russell, uh, we do have one more talk after this. It's going to be April 5th, and it's Carolyn Von Hammert about her epic journey um, by paddle boat and rowboat and, and uh, everything but on foot and pack raft um, from, from Bellingham all the way um, up north through Alaska and everything. So that's April 5th, I'll, but you'll see, see the flyer out at, at the library and on Facebook pretty soon. So I haven't ever met Russell Heath until tonight on Zoom. So I'm just going to read you the bio that I have. Um, he's led quite a fascinating life. In his teens, he hitchhiked to Alaska and lived in a cabin on the banks of the Tanana River. In his 20s, he lived in Italy and then traveled overland across the Sahara, through the jungles and over the savannas of Africa and into South Southern Asia. In his 30s, he sailed alone around the world in a 25-foot wooden boat, which we'll hear more about tonight. In his 40s, he wrote novels, and um, one of those is set about in Southeast Alaska. Um, and I encourage you to read it. I'm, I'm working my way through it. It's quite interesting. Um, in his 50s, he bicycled the spine of the Rockies from Alaska to Mexico. He's worked on the Alaska pipeline as an environmental and as an environmental lobbyist in the Alaska legislature and ran a storied environmental organization fighting to protect Alaska's coastal rainforest. In 2010, he left Alaska and moved to New York City to dig deep into leadership development and coaching. He lives now in a cabin on the rocky coast of Maine and coaches business and nonprofit leaders intent on making big things happen in the world. So um, thank you for being with us, Russell, tonight. It's uh, late in Maine and um, we all look forward to listening to your talk. Thanks. Thank you, Cindy. Hi, everybody. I uh, can't tell you how Happy I am to be happy I am to be connected to Haynes if 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 virtually. So it was mid-afternoon, August 6, 1985, when Bob and I raised the sails and slow, sailed slowly out of the <clears throat> out of Elfham Cove in southeast Alaska. We were bound for Seattle, and the sky was gray, the winds light, the sea quiet. And ahead of us was this wall of islands. Behind them was Cross Sound, which opened up into the Gulf of Alaska. As we approached the islands, this big gray boat steamed around them and headed our way. And the skipper comes out onto the wing deck, and he's got this big aggressive belly, and he's all dressed in gray. And he starts saying, go back, go back. I didn't know what he was trying to tell us. I think maybe there's a rock, an uncharted rock in front of us. So I run into the bow and I look all around, but I don't see anything. So I look back at him and he's going, go back, go back. And then the boat, his boat steams by and he goes, oh, fuck you. Well, we keep sailing on. 
And some of you might suspect that our first day at sea is not gonna go up, turn out very well. And I need to set the context here. And the context is this. I had been on a sailboat before, but my responsibilities had never risen above just keeping the hell out of the way. So we come out from behind those islands and we're slammed by this wall of wind. And we're instantly swallowed <clears throat> by this thick fog and Kainui, with all her sails up, starts heaving over these gigantic waves that are piling in from the North Pacific. And when she comes up these waves, when the wave passes under her, she falls, it's like free fall, right into the trough and there's spray and there's water everywhere and the rig shaking back and forth like that. But I know exactly what to do because I'd made a really close reading of sailing for dummies. And I yell at Bob, Bob, we need to take in a reef. But Bob's, he's wedged into the cockpit. He's got the jib sheet in one hand and the main sheet in another hand. And he's got the tiller under his, shell, his elbow. And he says, no, I ain't moving from here. I mean, it was totally illusionary. But it was the only control he had. And he wasn't giving it up. So I stumble forward to the mast. And again, the boat is just heaving and rocking. Got way too much sail up. And I sit down there and I look where I'm standing there looking, trying to figure out how to take in a reef. And as I'm doing that, trying to figure it all out, Bob yells, hey, we're on a lee shore. So for those of you who've read the Hornblower books or the Audrey books, you know you never want to be on a lee shore. And I look downwind and sticking out of the, rock, out of the water is this big pyramidal rock and these house high waves are obliterating themselves on it. And the surf is just surging and, <clears throat> and sucking around it. I mean, it was instant death. Bob, we got to take in a reef. So I turn back to the mast. I'm trying to figure these things out. So the previous winter, when I was still in Juneau, I'd taken the mast off the boat and I stored it in a friend's basement. And I stripped all the hardware off of it and then sanded down the varnish down to bare wood and then put 10 coats of varnish back on. The mast is this beautiful piece of Sitka spruce. So when I came to screw in all the hardware and reattach it, I had three or four pieces left over that I didn't know what they, what they were for or where they went. So I just tossed them in my rigger, rigging bucket. But as I was sitting there looking at trying to figure out how to take in this reef, I figured out what those pieces were for. So I dropped below, got them out of the rigging bucket and got a pair of pliers and a screwdriver. And as I turned to go back on deck, I vomited. It came from the bottom of my belly all the way out my throat, arced all the way across the cabin and splattered against the other side on the far wall. And it was like I'd been hit by a sledgehammer. My knees buckled and I fell into the bulwarks. And I just climbed back up on deck and there's vomit coming down my chin. And I go forward and I, I do what I need to do to to shorten sail and uh, Kainui, she's such a beautiful boat. As soon as I had the right amount of sail on her, she just goes loping over those big waves coming in from the South Pacific. As soon as I had the, the, the reef in, I stagger back to the deck and I lay belly down on it and I put my head over the rail and I'm heaving and I'm retching long past there's anything left to come up, nothing but stomach lining and bits of small intestine. So in the two years that I've dreamed of this trip, dreamed of tropical isles, blue lagoons, girls in grass dresses, it never once occurred to me, not once, that I might get seasick. And it never, and I had no idea, just no idea how unbelievably miserable it was. So as I lay there with my head over the rail, with waves washing over me every time Kainui rolled, I said to myself, no, this is not fun. I'm not putting up with this. And I decided at that point that I was gonna sell the boat <clears throat> and end the trip, but I had a problem. And the problem was this, that just a few days before I'd had this big gigantic champagne soaked going away party. And if I returned home, if I got back to Juno just two days into my round the world trip, the humiliation would be too much to bear. So I decided that I would go to Seattle and I'd sell the boat in Seattle. 
I could put up with this misery until then. So all the rest of the afternoon, we just did these little tacks. We were lost in the fog. We had no idea where we were. And we were trying hard not to hit anything. And, you know, there's a lot of things to hit and cross sound. So the night fell and we saw even less of nothing. Tacking back and forth, just in the black of the night. And then sometime around midnight, the wind lays down, the sea quiets. And when the sun finally came up the next morning, we were just nestled in this white cloud of fog. <laughs> but if you look straight overhead, straight above you, you can see clear blue sky and in the northern horizon, powering 14,000 feet into the sky was Mount St. Elias. So we sat there in her puddle of blue until about mid-morning when this little wind tiptoed down out of the Northwest and plucked at Kainui's sails and slowly she gathered way heading out, and as we headed out into the Gulf of Alaska, Mount St. Elias rolled back into the fog. It was my last night of Alaska for many years. So you guys know all this. Let me get rid of this here. Well, that's Cross Sound. Gulf of Alaska. These are these are small ways compared to what we have. But that's the only thing I could find on the web. Here we are, <clears throat> getting getting re ready to go. This is on the grid there in Juneau, and I didn't have enough money to paint our whole bottom, so I just painted the parts that were <clears throat> that needed it the most. There's Bob Bob Frampton. He used to live out in Amalga Harbor. He, he's now down in in Washington. And you guys can see that. So this is the first part of the trip, down to Seattle and then down the coast, all the way to Costa Rica. But before I get too deeply into this talk, I'd like to forestall a question. And the question is this, why the hell would you put up with something like this? And you know, frankly, I don't have a clue. I am reminded of a book, it's called The White Nile, it's written by Alan Moorhead. And it's a history of the search for the sources of the Nile during the 19th century. And you have no idea what those guys, you know, Richard Burton, Speaks, Livingstone, what those guys put up with. You know, the disease, the infections, the parasites, the, the heat, the poisonous snakes, the insects. I mean, half the time those guys were delirious. They're totally out of their mind. They're being carried by stretchers across the savanna by their porters. And so Alan Moorhead asks the obvious question, why would they put up with it? Even more, why would they go back? Because many of them did. And he writes a 12, 13 page essay explaining why they did this. And you read this and you understand that he's clueless. He's like a He's like a, a man trying to explain childbirth to a mother of 12. Or you think of Sir Edmund Hillary when he asked why he climbed Everest. He said, well, it's because it's there. And I always thought that was just a really smug thing to say, but it occurred to me he probably didn't know either. But maybe one of my girlfriends came closest when we were breaking up. She accused me of not having enough oxytocin in my system. You know, oxytocin is the, is the hugging hormone. And, you know, she's probably right. But the story that most resonates with me is a story that Bruce Chatwin tells in his book, The Song Lines. And The Song Lines is about Australian Aborigines. He tells the story of this man who finds a wild swan who's injured. And he takes her home, puts her in a cage, nurses her back to health. And for months and months, she's perfectly content to be in that cage. And then one day, it's time to go. It's time to migrate wherever swans go in Australia. And she just started beating herself bloody against the bars of the cage. And because he was worried she, she would kill herself, he let her free. You know, the day, the very instant that I learned you could sail a small boat across an ocean, it was as, it was as if God leaned out of the clouds and just whacked me with a, with a hammer. I had no choice, none at all. I never stopped to consider the pros and cons, the risks of not coming back alive or what it would do to my future earnings potential or my marriage prospects. I just had to go. 
So Bob and I sailed offshore about 300 miles and then headed down the coast. And it was my intention to learn how to navigate on the way to Seattle. I had no GPS. I didn't want to do any electronics. I wanted to do it all with a sextant and charts. And, and I had everything on board to navigate celestially. But I had another problem. And that problem was that I was so nauseous. I was so unbelievably nauseous, I couldn't even begin to read the manuals. But you know, North America is hard to hit. You sail south a thousand miles or so and turn left, you're bound, bound to run into it. And eventually we found Seattle, Bob left, headed back to Alaska, and I continued on down the coast myself. <clears throat> I stopped in San Diego for the winter. And my plan was, not a winter to work. And my plan was that if I had less than $5,000 next May, I would go through the canal and work again in Florida. If I had more than $5,000, I'd head across the Pacific towards Australia. So <clears throat> when it was time to leave, just at the beginning of the hurricane season, I had $4,500 in cash, a tax return, and an old Honda Civic, you know, the size of a refrigerator that I couldn't sell. But when I added it all up, it was more than $5,000. So I decided I was going to go west. But first to Costa Rica. And I need to say, on that trip down, all the way down the coast from Alaska, every day a debate raged in my head. To go or not to go? To continue on and put up with the nausea, the cold, the wet? Or to sell the boat and move back ashore? I had no idea when I was planning this trip how hard it is on your body to be in a little boat in an open sea, nor the stress of long watches at sea or the stress of going to sleep and not knowing what you might run into or what might run into you. And in truth, all the way down that coast, the only thing that was keeping me going was inertia. I spent two years putting the trip together, buying the boat, all the equipment, earning the money, two years. And it was the pressure of all that work that kept me moving. I didn't have the courage to say no to it, but I was no longer chasing a dream. Then everything changed. So it's 500 miles from the southern tip of Mexico down to Costa Rica. With good winds, that's a five or six day passage. It took me 19. It was the most brutal passage of the entire circumnavigation. There's no wind. I got offshore and Kainui just bobbed in the sea, her sails hanging on her limp as laundry. And then as we sat there, there'd be the storm, these black clouds would heave over the horizon and the clouds would grow and grow and grow. They just billow up into the sky, higher than I thought clouds could ever go. And in those clouds, there was thunder and lightning. And it wasn't your normal thunder and lightning. Right, I know we don't get much in Southeast Alaska, but this thunder and lightning never stopped. It was consistent. It was like a war zone. The explosions were all around us and they never quit. The shock waves from the thunder were so great that they fibrillated my eardrums. It's like somebody playing the snare drums on them. And the, and the lightning never quit either. It was so bright that I could work out on deck at night without a flashlight. But that wind, the wind that was in those storms, sometimes like 40, 50, even 60 knot, was the only wind I had on that whole passage, right? So <clears throat> I'd put up the storm sails, I'd sit out there in the cold, and I'd hold that tiller and try and get three or four more miles before the storm passed overhead and left us becalmed. 500 miles, that's 19 days, that's 26 miles a day. When I finally dropped anchor in a protected cove in Costa Rica, I felt the stress just flow out of my body. But what filled in behind it was something I didn't expect. What filled in behind it was, was a sense that I was a sailor now. Not that I knew what I was doing, not that I was any good, and certainly not that I was a master, but I knew that I was at home. I was at home at the sea. And from that point on, there's no question that I would keep on moving. So some of the hot lightning, like I say, just never stopped. So in Costa Rica, I still had a lot of work to do on the boat. Here I've careened her on the, on the beach. 
um, so I could work on her bottom. You know, the, the old pirates used to careen their, their galleons on the, on the beach, let the tide go out. Um, it was a really dumb idea and never did it again. So from Costa Rica, head down to Ecuador and from Ecuador out to the Galapagos. My sister and her husband were in the Peace Corps in Ecuador. And here I'm going up a canal to the largest city in Ecuador, Guayaquil. And of course I run aground after going through the locks. I had to wait for the tide to come in and float me off. But I picked up my sister and, and, and her husband Roque and we went out to the Galapagos and here's Roque, he, he got a mahi mahi, which is the best, one of the best eating fishes in the tropics. He was so excited. If you've ever wondered why they call it the head, that's why. These are blue-footed boobies in, in the Galapagos. And these are the westernmost islands of the Galapagos. The L-shaped one, the backward L is Isabella. And then the one nestled right up on the side is Fernandina. So it was a gray day in November when I weighed anchor and came out from behind Fernandina. We picked up the trades. We were headed to Pitcairn Island. So Pitcairn Island is where the mutineers, the bounty, hit out from the British Admiralty in 1795. Pitcairn is as far from the Galapagos as Eastern Maine is from San Diego, more than 3,000 miles. And this is our first true ocean crossing. And I was worried. I was worried that we wouldn't, we wouldn't find Pitcairn when we got there. Because all the way down from Cross Sound to the Galapagos, I never once made a pinpoint landing. I never figured out how to work that damn sextant or the celestial navigation. But it's not a big deal when you're running down the side of a continent. You know, you just come in, pick up the land, and run down to your destination. Pitcairn was one mile in diameter, easy to miss. So every day I do a morning, noon, and afternoon shot, and I'd reduce them and plot our position, never certain that that's where we truly were. And you got to understand it's really difficult to use a sextant on a small boat. So I climb out on deck with a sextant wrapped into my belly to protect it from salt spray and damage if I fell. And what you need to do, there are mirrors, there's a series of mirrors and there's a little telescope on it. And what you want to do is, is grab the body you're looking at, and usually it's the sun, right? And manipulate a lever that changes the mirrors that makes it look like the sun's falling out of the sky. And your goal is to have that bottom edge of the sun just kiss the horizon. And of course, you got to do this all the time while the boat is bucking and heaving. <clears throat> and, and you've got to have a death grip on the boat so you don't pitch overboard. And you've got to know the exact distance from where you are to the horizon so you can do your trigonometry. But when the boat's on the top of a, of a, of a wave, the horizon's farther away. And when you're at the bottom of the wave, the horizon's closer. So you've got to time your... your yeah, not only do you have to hold on to the damn boat, but you got to time your, your, your sight to just the right time uh, when, the, when the waves pick you up. So that's pretty hard. And every day, I, but every day I'd get a, a fix. But as we ran south, I ran into another problem. And that was I was passing underneath the sun. When we started out from the Galapagos, the sun's in the southern sky. But when we arrived at Pitcairn, which is south of the Tropic of the Cap Capricorn, the sun's going to be in the northern sky. And the problem here is that when the sun's directly overhead, it's pretty much worthless for navigating. You just can't use it. Right? So the only thing I had left was the moon, planets, and the stars. And you think it's hard to find the sun in your scope and keep it there and have it come down to the horizon. Try doing it with a speck of light that's buzzing around the sky like a bee on speed. And not only is it difficult to find that B on speed in your scope, but you're not sure you have the right one because they all look the same. So it's even worse than that because unlike the sun where you have the whole day, the stars, you only have 15 days in the morning at, at dawn and 15 days at dusk when it's light enough to see the horizon, but dark enough to see the stars. 
and you have to do three of them. So my Coast Guard na navigation manual says flat out that star sights, star sights on small boats are impossible and should not be attempted. And understand that for the Coast Guard, you know, 60 feet is a small boat. I was on 25, but I had no choice. So day after day, we headed Southwest. And every day I wondered how far off my navigation was. If I was off by just 30 miles, I'd sail right by the island, totally oblivious. And then how many days could I spend crisscrossing the ocean looking for it? But even worse, if I couldn't find Pitcairn, how could I find any of the atolls in French Polynesia where they're not higher than a, a coconut palm? So I read and reread my navigational manuals, looking for my air, looking for the calculation that I was screwing up or the correction that I was failing to add. And then one day I was standing on the deck, staring at the horizon, horizon as Kainui just bounded over the waves. And a sentence from the Coast Guard manual lit up in my brain. It was a sentence I'd read probably 10 or 20 times, but had never registered before. And the sentence was this, Coast Guard cadets are far more accurate with their sextant after they've taken 3,000 sites than when they've taken just 2,000. Well, at that point, I hadn't even taken 500. And what I realized there, that there was nothing missing in my understanding of celestial navigation, and there's nothing wrong with my calculations. I just hadn't mastered my instrument. So that one sentence completely changed my frame of reference. Instead of using the sextant, you know, like a butter knife, I had to use it like a scalpel. I had to master the craft and I had to do it really fast. So three weeks into the passage, we dropped south of the trades. We were south of the Tropic of Capricorn and we lost all but a breath of wind. I put up all the light sails and we drifted along. It might be one or two knots. By my reckoning, we were 110 miles northeast of Pitcairn, but I had no faith in this reckoning. We could have been anywhere. So it was cloudy that first day and I couldn't take any shots. So we just followed a compass course. We just dead reckoned. It was overcast the second day, but right at noon when the sun was directly overhead, it appeared like a ghost, just a paler shade of gray than the clouds. And I took sight after sight after sight before it disappeared back into the, uh, back into the clouds. You know, I knew it would be a bad, it wouldn't be very valuable because the sun again was directly overhead and you don't have an angle when you take it at the same time. Let me show you here. Oops. So this is a perfect, never seen in nature plot. The dark lines are called lines of position and those are essentially perpendicular to, to the body that you did the shot off of. And the X of course marks your, marks your spot. This is my plotting of, I, did, I, I reduced all 14 of the shots that I was able to take in about the 10 minutes that the sun was visible. And <clears throat> for reasons that I don't understand now, and by the way, this is a mess. Any Coast Guard cadet would, 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 would just sneer at this. For reasons I can't imagine now, that is what I determined was our position. And that's Pitcairn Island. It's only 20 miles away. Close enough to see. So I race up on deck and I run to the bow and I lean over the pulpit and right in front of me, a mile away is this rain squall, perfectly dark. But as I watch, it rains itself out and dissolves like a curtain rising. And right behind it, dead ahead, was Pitcairn Island. I'll tell you, there was some hooting and hollering on the boat that day. So there she is, Pitcairn Island. It took me another day to close it because I was just losing the wind. And the Pitcairners came out to get me and they took me all around the island. This is Adamstown, <clears throat> the only settlement on the island. When I was there, there were about 60 people, about 47, if I remember right, were, were native Pitcairners and the others were visitors. And I do need to explain the, par the photograph. As you might imagine, I'm not a photographer and I use this, just one roll of film, the same roll of film from Ecuador all the way to New Zealand, which is about 18 months. 
So that film had pretty much rotted by the time I had it developed. So I only stayed a day on Pitcairn. I, <clears throat> there's no protected harbor there and I sailed away just after dinner. But I'd like to say, you know, from that day on, I had no greater joy than walking to the front of the boat, leaning over the pulpit and wait for a canoe to lift a swell, lift to a swell and see a coconut frond poke above the horizon, another perfect landfall. And I also know that if I'd followed a GPS across the ocean, the joy wouldn't have been half so great than, than as it was when I did it myself. And I think there are times, you know, that when we flatten our lives, when we take the craft out of them. So from Pitcairn Island up into the <clears throat> up into the French Polynesia, across South Pacific, through Atutaki, um, Cook Islands, Nui, Fiji, and then down to New Zealand. Here she is creaming through the waters. This is taken from the bow. And you see that rust. I worked on her all the time, but as you know, the salt's a pretty harsh environment. Here we are, flying my spinnaker, that, that blue, blue sail there. Sorry about the laundry, but I'm flying wing and wing, so the wind's directly behind me. This is down below. I'd spend hours. I'm leaning against the boom gallows. It's an antique piece of equipment you never see on boats anymore, but it, the, it, uh, you, you can rest the mast in it. This is Bora Bora. And I took the picture. If you look over on the left side of the, you'll see a schooner taking off. And here I am, I'm in a lagoon in the westernmost island in French Polynesia, only six people live there. And you can see I'm sailing down my anchor. You can see how clear that water is. This is Atutaki in the Cook Islands. And just look at those palm trees, that's the trade winds. They just never quit, they're relentless. And understand that this village is on the leeward side of the island. So the protected side of the island. That's me. With hair, most of that hair is gone. And this was Kainui out in the in the lagoon. This is Henderson Island. And Henderson, they had um, you know, it was natural also in the Cook Islands. And what they're doing here is they would fish and they had generators and they could freeze the fish and then a buyer would come and you can see the buyers anchored outside the reef there. And the buyer would buy the fish and then take it back to Roatanga where the, where the capital of the cooks were and it has a tourist trade. So those would go, be sold to the hotels. That and coconut were their only cash income. Which is Nui, it's the largest coral island in the world. And those rocks are, those rocks are all coral that were, was uplifted out of the sea. And they were they were sharp as Ginza knives. Here I'm in Fiji. And this ironically was the first time I'd actually seen the sun set into the ocean. It usually set into a bank of clouds. And this gizmo at the at this on the stern of the boat is my wind vane. So it's designed to keep the boat the same angle to the wind. So it's a self-steer. So I don't have to be on the tiller the whole time. And for you boat geeks, this is the original self steerer steer. It was invented by a man named Blondie Hassler, a Britishman. And I can tell you the technology is much improved. And then I had a bad judgment. I left the sails up too long and blew them out one night in Fiji. I'm here. This boat is anchored in, 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 um, in New Zealand. You can see the skyscrapers in the background there. That's, that's not Fiji. It's Auckland. And there you can see a new, I had to buy a new sail in, in, uh, in New Zealand. The couple on the boat were a couple I met skiing. So I left Fiji in the winter. I had my skis aboard. I'm Alaskan after all. I wanted to go skiing in South, in, uh, on the South Island in, in New Zealand. And I met these two. These, these two were telemarkers as well. And then um, they came up to sail with me in the Bay of Islands in, north, in, the, um, 
on the north end of the of the island of New Zealand. And I taught them to how to turn the boat, to tack the boat back and forth, because I'd never seen Kainui under sail and not been on her. So I was in the raft taking the picture. Here we are again. All right, so from New Zealand to Melbourne, Australia. So it was November. And Kainui and I sail up and over New Zealand's toe and into the Tasman Sea. The Tasman is a bumpy sea. And by the time we were about two thirds of the way across, we had already weathered four gales. And the morning after the fourth gale, you know, I cracked the hatch and I sucked my head out to look around. The wind had laid down, but the seas were still big and lumpy and they were banging into Kainui from every which way. So she was kind of stagging around like a drunk. When I looked up at the sky, the sky was this pus colored with boils and pustules. It was just ghastly. So I slammed the shut, the hatch closed, <clears throat> went back down to sleep, letting Kainui to suffer it by herself. But within an hour, this wind powered up out of the Southern Ocean and relentlessly it grew and grew in strength. And it wiped the clouds clean from the sky, leaving a molten blue. And the seas began to build and the barometer began to drop. And by mid morning, I knew we were going to be in for a serious blow, much more than just a gale. So I stripped the deck, taking off anything that would be that could be carried away or broken. I put the storm shutters on, I lashed the mainsail to the boom and set the trysail, which is a tiny storm sail that's tough as steel. It was the first time I'd flown it since leaving Alaska. Then with all my woolens on and my foul weather gear, I went back up on deck and I clipped my harness into the boat and I watched the storm grow. By 11, it was blowing a full, a full storm, well over 50 knots. And if I stood, the wind was so strong that if I stood perpendicular to it, the Venturi effect was so strong, I couldn't inhale in my leeward nostril and the downwind nostril. And the wind, it pushed the top two or three inches of the water along much, <clears throat> much faster than the waves. So the water raced along the surface of the sea like a mountain brook and it would slice off a top layer of moisture of water and vaporize it. And for an instant, because the sky was clear and the sun was out, in that ball of vapor, there would be a tiny rainbow, just a single color. So you see flashes of reds and blues and green um, <clears throat> dancing in the waves before it vanished in a puff of, you know, just a puff of moisture was ripped away by the wind. So it's like everywhere you looked it was like pixies dancing in the waves. And as the waves picked up the boat and we were fully exposed to the wind, the whole rig would shake and the, <clears throat> and the wind would shrink in the rigging like, like somebody was being flayed alive. And when the wave passed <clears throat> and we dropped back down into the lee of the oncoming wave, you know, for one or two blessed seconds, it'd be quiet before it lifted back up into the raging storm. And then when the waves got high, they started breaking. And when they broke on Kainui, Landing on her deck, they just sounded her like a drum, just this big boom. Then tons of water would cascade down the down her decks, and I'd wrap myself around the boom so I wasn't swept away. And for an instant, the only thing that would be sticking above the water would be her mast. So every hour, I dropped down below to look at the barometer, wondering when it would start coming back up. But all afternoon, it dropped. And I stood at the deck watching the waves, wondering how big the storm would get. And you might have asked me, was I afraid? Were they scared? And you know, I wasn't. And it's not because I'm courageous. I just don't think I'm wired that way. So, you know, we have these fears, those fears of things that can hurt us, that could kill us, like sailing into the North Pacific and not knowing how to sail, <clears throat> walking along the edge of a cliff or someone coming at you with a knife. You know, those are fears that, those are fears of things that could really hurt us. But then there's another kind of fear, the fears of things that can't physically hurt us. You know, the fear of failure, of rejection, of looking weak, of opening your heart and telling someone else what's there. These fears don't draw blood, but these are the fears that stop me, that kind of narrow my life. So at 6.30 that evening, the barometer ticked up and I knew the low had passed. And by 10, I was cold, wet, and exhausted. <clears throat> I'd watched Kainui ride these waves for almost 12 hours without incident. So I dropped below 
and went to sleep, figuring we were safe. At 10.30, we were hit. This wave picked up my little boat, turned her upside down, and threw her into the water below. I was thrown into the overhead. My nose busted through a light fixture. Blood squirted everywhere. Kainui instantly flipped back up onto our feet, catapulting me into the bilges. The floorboards had been ripped out, and I froze there in the dark to feel her motion, to see if the mass was still on her. She moved slowly and stately, so I know it was. I went out on the deck. The night was black. There was no moon. These huge waves reared up and blocked out the stars in the lower part of the sky before crashing down on us. Whatever had hit us would pass, and there was nothing more I could do, so I went down below to clean up. She'd taken a lot of damage. The worst was a compression crack in the deck, and the whole cabin top had been shifted over, opening up a seam, so that every time a wave crashed on her, water, water poured down below. But it was something I could repair once I got to shore. We were hoped to another day. It was only on the third that I raised the sails and headed to Australia. So there she's flying the, the, the tri-sail. My camera dropped and, and the back popped open. That's why there's that light there. But you can see I have the, the mainsail lashed to the boom. So I was headed to Melbourne, Australia, which is in the southeast corner of the country. And cruisers don't go down there. It's out of the tropics, it's cold, and you have to cross the Tasman Sea, and only fools do that in a small boat. I was going down there looking for a man named Brian Lowe. So Brian had been born in Britain, and after the war, he'd emigrated to Canada. And in 1960, he'd had Kainui built. I'm her third owner. And when the second owner sold her to me, he told me that all he knew of Brian was that he'd he and his wife had retired to Australia, and he thought they were living in Melbourne. So that's where I was headed. So this is Kainui being built. She was built in Hong Kong. And here she shipped when she arrives in Vancouver. And this is Brian Lowe had his, in his cockpit. The uh, boat was professionally maintained back then, which is the only way you keep all that varnish alive. So when I got to Melbourne, I anchored up and ran looking for a payphone. There were still payphones back then. Found them in the phone book. There's still phone books back then. And I called them up. And he's a super proper British. Brian Lowe speaking. I say, my name's Russell Heath. I'm an American and we have a friend in common. Who might that be? Her name's Kainui. So there's this long pause on the phone. And then from far away, he says, I feel for you now. And I say, yes, I know. And she's down here in Melbourne Harbor. So Brian and his wife, Liz, became my friends. And months later, when I and Kainui and I were back up in the tropics, he, they came up for a sail and sailed one last time in the Coral Sea. And I need to say, Brian Lowe just died a year ago. He was 108. So had to do a refit. This is in Northern, so I spent six months working in Melbourne. I was broke when I got there, just had $49 left and I got a job, worked for six months and sailed her back up into the tropics in the Australian winter, um, which was pretty bumpy sail as well. But anyway, I had to haul her out, do a lot of work. I replaced the, the rigging. Here I'm knocking out the keel bolts. You need to check them because if they're rusted through, you know, you might lose your keel. But those bolts were great. These are chain plates. Chain plates anchor the wires that support the mast. And I was just hammering them gently with a chisel to get off the rust before painting them. And my chisel went right through one of those chain plates, which was pretty sobering given that I was upside down just a six months before. So I had to replace those two on those brand new stainless steel never going to break chain plates on her. Uh, I had no greater joy than working on the boat. As soon as she was anchored up, the tools came out. Whoops, didn't know I left this in there. This was a woman I met there and her two girls. 
They made my stay in Australia heavenly. So from Australia, from Melbourne, up the west coast, east coast of Australia, over the top to Darwin, and then across the Indian Ocean to Sri Lanka. Here we are, this is the East Timor Sea. The sun is directly overhead. It is unbelievably hot. You, I could not go out in the, in the open sun at noon. It's like somebody rubbing chili peppers into your skin. So stocking up at, at um, a food in Sri Lanka, there's not a lot of food in the islands and it was a long way to Egypt to our next port. These men would wake me up every morning in the dugout canoe. They were fishing. They had a little persane net. And I don't know how they did it. The, the fish they caught weren't any bigger than, 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 you know, it would hardly feed your cat. And I don't know how it kept five men alive or five fa four families alive. So from Sri Lanka down to the Maldives, across the Arabian Sea, up into the Gulf of Aden, the Red Sea to Suez. So here, here I am, this is Malay in, in the Maldives. The Maldives is, is this archipelago of islands off the southwest coast of India. And this is the main waterfront where boats coming in from the outer atolls come in with, with goods to trade. Here I am in, in one of those atolls and these boys came out to say hi. Just look at that water. This is the headman's wife. Here we are in the Gulf of Aden. This is the first boat. So we've crossed the Arabian Sea. Kanui and I have crossed the Arabian Sea and we're coming up to Yemen, South Yemen. And if you look really carefully at the stack of that freighter, it's got a hammer and sickle on it. So South, South, South Yemen was the only Marxist Arab country. And so Soviet boats would stop and bunker there. And this is 1989. So just a few months after that, you know, the the uh, the Berlin Wall wall fell. This was our my black market currency dealer. I sold dollars in exchange for Yemeni currency. And now this is Djibouti. So we're over in Africa, across across the way, across the Gulf from from Ada, uh, from Yemen. And that's an old dow where the rig's been taken off her and a diesel's been put in and they're running cattle from Djibouti, which is Djibouti's only export over to Saudi Arabia. And you did not want to be downwind of that boat. So now I'm in the Red Sea, lots of shipping traffic. There's a freighter coming down from the Suez Canal. So here I'm in the Suez Canal. So I get to the Suez Canal and the canal authority didn't want us, didn't want me in the canal, didn't want Kanui and I in the canal. They came down, even the, 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 the main safety guy who'd been educated at the University of Pennsylvania, his English was flawless, came down to look at Kainui. And, you know, Kainui is powered by an outboard. And he said, no boat has ever gone through the canal powered by an outboard. We don't think it's safe. And so you're not going to get in, which is somewhat daunting because the only other way to get home was to go the long way around Africa. So I hired a shipping agent and I asked that shipping agent to find out how much it would cost me to change the canal authority's mind. Well, it was 20 bucks and they let us in. But here's the irony. And the irony is this, that a few miles south of the Mediterranean, my little engine blew compression in her bottom cylinder. It was a 10 stroke Honda outboard. And we went from six knots to three quarters of a knot, which meant we were in the canal after sundown, which is a major no-no. And a number of people got tremendously upset. But by then I was in the Mediterranean and welcome to their upset. I was quite happy. So through the Mediterranean now, straight to Gibraltar, across the Atlantic, and back to Maine. 
And just as an aside, the run through the Mediterranean was the most difficult run after the one going down to Costa Rica from Mexico. It was February, March. It was desperately cold. The wind blew on, on my nose out of the Northwest every day. And on a good day, you know, tacking into that wind over and over again, we would make only 30, 35 miles. And then every fourth or fifth day, there'd be a gale that blow us backwards. It was 2,000 miles from Port Said to the Straits of Gibraltar, and it took us two months, which averages to 33 miles a day. 33 miles in a straight line a day. Anyway, it was dusk when we finally sailed through the Straits of Gibraltar and headed out into the Atlantic. And by that point, I was exhausted. It had been night after night after night of standing watch. There's so much traffic in the Mediterranean. I couldn't go to sleep. And the cold and the wind. And by the time we nose out into the Atlantic, all right, it was getting dark, it was dusk, and everywhere I looked, coming down from the north, coming in from the west, and coming up from the south were lights of big boats, big freighters, all headed to the Straits of Gibraltar. And, you know, I didn't care. I just flipped on our running lights and collapsed on a berth and fell asleep, letting Kainui sail us out into the Atlantic. So the sailing directions for a westward crossing of the Atlantic are simple. Sail south until the butter melts, turn right. So Kainui and I left Madeira, a Portuguese island off the west coast of Africa in late May of 1989. As we took in the mooring line and set the sails and started ghosting out of the harbor, people standing on the quay waved at us, shouting, shouting goodbye. These were people who had just stepped out of the Mediterranean, who were just starting their trips across the uh, across the oceans to distant isles. And during our short stay in Madeira, they had peppered me with questions. How do you anchor in coral? How do you heave to in a gale? How do you stay awake on those long nighttime watches? Kainu and I, we were the old salts now. But we waved goodbye, sailed south until we nestled again in the easterly trades and turned westward. We were bound for Bar Harbor. It was our last ocean crossing and our longest, 4,300 nautical miles, about 5,000 statute miles. And those first weeks were just glorious. The sky, the sky, sky blue, the wind's easy, and the following seas, gentle and forgiving. And Kainui just slipped through the blue water, just pulled by her spinnaker. Two months earlier, we had stopped in Italy. And in a sorry fit of self-improvement, I bought a book titled introduction to poetry. It was a big buy for me because I was pretty much out of money and I didn't have enough books to get all the way across the Atlantic. So I instantly regretted it. I mean, Tom Clancy would have done so much better by me. So it wasn't until I was about halfway across the Atlantic before I dug, drug that book up on deck and started poking into it. Poetry made no sense to me. It was, if you had something to say it, you know, just say it. Make it as clear as a recipe and joy of cooking. But as I read that chapter on rhyme and the chapter on, <clears throat> on meter and the chapter on metaphor, the poems of the book started coming out of the mist. They started making sense to me. And I found that they, they amplified, they gave voice to the feelings that were churning in me. Feelings about sailing around the globe, of standing night watch, standing watch night after night under starry skies, of going home. So in the afternoons, when the sun was in the Western sky, I would go forward and sit with my back against the mast and in the shade of the spinnaker and memorize poems, feeling their music in me. And then in the evening, when the sun was low and the colors rich, I would sit on the pulpit, the very bow of the boat, like a figurehead. All of Kainui was behind me. All I could see was the sky and the sea and the line where they met. And I would recite those poems, built them out to the gulls and the flying fish that Kainui would flush from the water. And those poems would rise goosebumps on my arms and bring tears in my eyes. I was going home. So, you know, in the round of a journey from when you step over your threshold until you come back to it, it's in the departure and the return that your know, life most, most lives in you. When you're most exposed to the workings of your soul, in the departure, it's the call to adventure, to the call to challenge, the tang of danger and the unknown, and the excitement of lurch, launching a dream that you've long worked towards. And in the return, it's the melancholy of something epic ending, the longing of hearth and home, 
you know, the anticipated embrace of family and friends and the uncertainty of not knowing what's coming next. So it was on June 28th, we crossed the Gulf Stream. And a couple of days later, we came up onto George's Bank, which are a few hundred miles off the coast of Massachusetts. And the sky clouded up and the air was just thick with mist and it could just smell those mud banks, even though they are 30 fathoms below us. And this large flock of seagulls landed in front of us. And I and I just ghosted through under light airs. And as we came to them, the seagulls opened up this passageway that was sharp and straight as if they'd marked it off in a rule. And then when the, the birds we passed, when they were 30 or 40 yards behind us, they'd fly up and settle on the water in front of us again, only to part as we came through. They did this again and again all afternoon, escorting us home. So T.S. Eliot says, to make an end is to make a beginning. And you're know, standing on that deck, closing the coast of Maine, I decided on my next, on my beginning, my next beginning. I decided to step off my path of wandering. This was my second time around the world. And there've been many trips to distant places in between. So step off that path of wandering and onto the path of connection and community. I would marry, I would find a job that I loved and with my own hands, build a home. This would be my new beginning. You know, it's a path that millions of people travel every day, but it was new to me and I was excited to get started. And, you know, standing on that deck, it never occurred to me that I'd never be able to make it fully happen. It was like that swan who was beating her breast against the bars of the cage. Wandering wasn't something I could say no to and connection didn't call me strong enough. So on our 51st day at sea, we raised the outline of Mount Cadillac on the distant horizon. All day we closed it, and in the late afternoon, fog started settling down on us. And before we became fully fog bound, I took bearings on Egg Rock and Cranberry Isles. And then when the fog settled on us, we just blindly followed the compass bearing in to Frenchman Bay. But just as we entered the bay, we pull out of the fog bank, and the sky above us is this cloud, cloudless and deep, deep burgundy and is dusted with a thousand silver stars and then hanging in the western horizon diamond bright was Venus. So we sail up the bay, we round up behind Bar Island and an easy breeze <clears throat> in an easy breeze and then at 1020 July 3rd 1989 I let go of the anchor and set it in good rich American mud. We were home. Oops sorry. So all summer, this, this, by the way, was taken by the newspaper, the, the local newspaper when I, um, when they came down to interview me. Just look at the, uh, the rust coming out of her cutwaters there. She was hard used crossing that Atlantic. This is all the stuff off the boat. So all summer I work on her cleaning, repairing, scraping, painting, varnishing. And then in the fall, we sail down coast to a boatyard tucked into a small cove. I guide Kainui into the slings of a travel lift and watch as she's lifted from the water and carried into a dusty field. It takes only a few minutes for the yard hands to chalk and secure her, and then they leave us, the travel lift lumbering away. I pull the halyards through their blocks in the masthead coil and toss them in a pile. I strip the deck of the sheets and winch handles, snatch blocks and anchors, whatever's not made fast and stow it all below. I unship the wind vane, flush the outboard with fresh water, pour oil into its cylinders and lift it into the bilges. Lift it down into the bilges where it was stowed for our, our ocean crossings. I stack the sails in the forepeak, wipe salt spray from the sextant, unclip the leads to the batteries, open lockers, lift cushions, so that air will circulate in her hard to reach places. I work fast, pushed by some internal urgency, some need to move to get on to the next thing. I'm lost in my world of lists and deadlines, of reflex and mindlessness. And while I work, Kainui sits silently, beached and ungainly, dead to the breeze ruffling the water in the cove below. Her fate is now delivered into the hands of a boat broker. 
The last item checked off my list. I locked the hatch, gather up my tools, and walk to the car. Then it's as if his hand reaches, reaches out and pushes against my chap, and I pop out of my world of busyness, and it comes to me that these are my last minutes with her. I rest my hand on her white hull and remember how she leapt before the winds and slipped through the waves and how her mast had arced under star-studded skies and how she had borne me across oceans, sheltering me from wind, rain, and the restless sea. So I climb into my Civic. It's packed with everything I own. I release the brake, drive out of the yard and onto the paved road and rev it up through the gears and I am gone. Oh, Cindy, I'm open for questions or comments or thoughts. Yes, any, anybody have any questions? I guess I have a, a question. So, you know, I've read a lot of books about people sailing. And these days, of course, they have you know, solar panels and they have satellite phones and, and water makers and refrigerators and freezers and vacuums and everything, um, which sounds like you didn't have most of those things. Uh, how did you deal with water? Like, what was your longest passage? And did you, did you have worries about running out of fresh water? Yeah, good question. So, so I um, I did not have a water maker. <laughs> I didn't have an inboard engine. Um, I had, I'm trying to remember, I had 30 gallons of water inside and I had five gallons by my, my life raft. So I had 40 gallons, well, 35 gallons on board. Water was not a problem. I was cautious with it. So I would cut it with salt water. You know, you cook pasta or something like that. You can you can have a third of it salt water. It's not too bad. Or cook your oatmeal or whatever. I I the longest passage was fifty one days, which is a little over seven weeks, and and that water lasted those seven weeks. I had a rig. Um, I had holes at the low. I had little shut, little cocks, little faucets, taps at the low point of, of the decks. And if I got hit by a, um, a a rainstorm, a squall, I could block up the holes that release the water from the deck into the ocean, and I'd sheet the 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 sails so that they're they're um, you know fore and aft, they're right down the center line of the boat, and rain would land on the on the water, and a lot of water would pour in the deck, and then I could open up those taps, and I could fill my water bottles that way, but I. Never used the system. I just tested it to make sure it worked, but it, but I never had to use it. That's pretty amazing. And what about um, you know these people these days? They can get weather reports every night about where the the eye of the big storm is and which way it's going to go. Did you have any way of checking on the weather? No, no. You know, in the tropics, the weather's really predictable. There's a hurricane season and there's the non season, and the tropics don't have frontals frontal storms coming through like we do up in the temperate regions. So you don't usually have storms like that. Um, the, the thing too, on a boat, you know, I average like three miles an hour, four miles an hour. So if you've got a storm coming from towards you, there's not a hell of a lot you can do. <laughs> I, I will say that when I was in Atutaki, so I was uh, the first boat to leave French Polynesia uh, before really the end of the hurricane season. It turned out to be premature. So. I, I left French Polynesia, which usually doesn't get hit by hurricanes, and went into went to uh, the Cook Islands. And while I was in Atataki, there was a uh, a storm, a cyclone that was headed right for the island. So I left the island and headed due north. The 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 storm was going southeast, and it missed me by just about 300 miles. So that was the closest I came to a, a serious a serious storm. Wow, pretty amazing. So I have a question. Do you, did you have any uh, concerns about piracy when you're going to the Red Sea? No, no, the, the, the piracy actually at the time was off of Somalia in the Arabian Sea. Okay. And, you know, which is right next door. So you're, you're close. And, and 
at the time I was going, it hadn't taken off like it did later in the 90s. Okay. Right. And I'd never heard of a yacht that had been boarded um, there. Now, there were pirates off of the Malacca Straits that had bothered some of the yachts that I ran into, but no. Okay. You must have looked poor enough. They didn't think you were a good target. There, there are some advantages, yes. <laughs> no, you know, the, the greatest danger sailing was by being by yourself because you can't keep a 24 hour watch, but even more importantly, you can't have somebody say, you know, Russell, I don't think that's a really good idea. Maybe we should think a little bit more about this. So you had to eat your, your mistakes. Looks like we got a couple questions in the chat. So, so David Johnson, so what have you done since 1989, which is like 40 years ago or whatever, what was your last sailing? Was that your last sailing? It was almost my last sailing. I, I, a friend of mine asked me to do a delivery with them from Fort Lauderdale up to Connecticut. And we got hit by a, a monster storm off, off somewhere off of, um, I can't remember where I was, probably off of Virginia. Um, it, and this was a big fancy boat. This was a 70 foot aluminum, you know, whatever kind of boat is worth my, well, whatever. But other than that, no, I haven't sailed. You know, I get seasick, so I, I had enough of that. <laughs> so curious about food, favorite food, staples, fish much. Oh boy. Well, so I'm a vegetarian, so I didn't have to worry about meat. And I got, I had no refrigeration on board and no ice, ice uh, chest or anything like that. But I got really good at managing my food so that even crossing the Atlantic when I had 51 days, you know, seven weeks at sea, I still had fresh food left. I mean, it wasn't that fresh, but it was still produce. So, um, you know, they're, they're funny stories. Like I don't, you know, I'm pretty crunchy. I don't eat food out of a can. And I thought I'd need to have a lot of canned goods. And those cans, I never ate at them. They just rusted in the bilges and, and, and I ended up throwing them overboard. Uh, but basic rice and beans and lots of vegetables. And about fishing, there's a bit of a funny story here. So when I was... When I was going from that trip from southern Mexico to uh, Costa Rica, and I got hit by all those storms, that really brutal, brutal passage, the, the, um, I got picked up by the school of, of Dorado or whale fish or mahi mahi. So these are big hunting fish. They're right at the surface. They can grow up to eight feet long and they iridesce in the water. This unbelievably beautiful fish. And I, this, this whole school of 50 to 100 fish would follow Kainui as she was just ghosting along, one or two knots under the water. And, and I was sitting here thinking that all my friends back in Alaska would be really upset at me if I didn't try and catch one of these fish. So of course I had fishing gear and my survival uh, equipment. So I pulled out this hundred pound test with a hoochie in the end of it and threw it in. And I learned that they, they didn't know it was food until it hit a certain speed. And then they all went at it. It was just like this crazy frenzy. And they were knocking the, the, the hoochie all out of the water. And finally, one of them caught it. And I hauled this thing aboard. And of course, I was totally unprepared. I know how to cook it or um, kill it. And I'm, <clears throat> I tie off the line against a cleat. And I drop below to get a hammer. And I'm up there trying, whamming on it. And there's blood everywhere. It was like a slasher movie. And then I ate the fish. And of course, I didn't have refrigeration. So I had to throw most of it away. And then the boat stank of fish, and I never fished after that. It was it was totally traumatic. And then Betsy, what happened to Kainui? So Kainui, I sold Kainui to a, a wooden boat builder, and he took her apart. He stripped the, he took the deck off. He took her all the way down to the hull and rebuilt her. So he, she looks very different now than she did originally. Um, and he did a beautiful job. And he and his wife were going to go sailing decided they didn't like it it's, it's really hard to be out <laughs> out in a big sea in a little boat so they came back and lived on her for a long time and then sold her just two years ago um to a young guy who who was also learning how to be a boat builder and he wanted to sail around the world and he got as far as florida and decided that she's too slow and she he, too small to have parties on so he 
he was going to bring her back to Maine. He had somebody here who would buy her. And on his way back, he ran her aground, which is not unusual. I ran her aground 14 or 15 times. But he ran her aground and and when the when the and the on a falling tide, and when the tide came back, a, a, a chop came in and kept pushing the boat back and eventually sheared off its rudder. And then the rudder, he went overboard to grab the rudder, he tied the rudder to the boat, and the rudder pounded a hole through the through the hull, and she was taking on water. He he managed to 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 plug the hole and eventually get her back to Maine. He he, he trucked her up and just gave her to somebody and is sitting and she's sitting right now in a field oh, about two hours from where I am right now. And I go by every once in a while and say hi to her. She's she's looking pretty forlorn. So I haven't met the new owner. My hope is that that he uh, he he you know rebuilds her and and uh, goes sailing with her again. Any other questions? Well, then um, I will say thank you very much, Russell. That was a fascinating talk. I, um, I've always wanted to go sailing, but, but I'm kind of a chicken. So um, uh, I, <laughs> this, is, this is the way I like to hear about, about sailing stories. So thank you very much. We really, really, really before, appreciate it. Oh, yes. Before we go, Cindy, I'd like to flog my books. Yeah. So this is Wind's Crossing. As far as I know, it's, it's Alaska's only political thriller. It's, it's it's a nearly award winner, and uh, Kirk has called it one of the the hundred best independently published books of. I think it was two thousand eighteen when it came out, or nineteen. And this one, Snow Angels. Hmm. See that? Unfortunately, your library doesn't have them. Um, I'd be glad to donate one there if if, if the library be open open to some copies. Yes, absolutely. I was actually just writing these down, so we'd, we'd be glad to have them in our collection. All righty. Um, I'll, send them, I'll send them care of you. Yeah, yeah you can just send it to uh, Haynes Library, or you can put my name on it. Uh, uh, either one, and I'll make sure it gets to our collections. Excellent. I'd be glad to do that. Excellent. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. That was a fascinating story. Thanks. Thank you, Cindy. See yes. all. Thanks a lot, Russell. I mean, I thought driving to 33 miles was a long trip, so <laughs> <laughs> that was fantastic. Yes. Be well. Good night, everyone.